Hi everyone, my name is Tim Elson, and I am going to be your Block 1 Lecture Instructor. I'm Kathy H's counterpart, and uh, this is my first time teaching a uh, lecture in the classroom. So uh, this is going to be very exciting and uh, a little different, and uh, it's kind of a learn learning curve for me as far as using uh, the Screencast-O-Matic and doing my lectures online uh, for you to hear. So, uh, you know, bear with me. My uh, goal is to not say um and like uh, a million times. So anyways, uh, the way I work um, is I'm going to cover chapter 19. I'm going to do volume one, which is pages 370 to 407, and I'll use uh, volume two, which is going to be the 231 to 331 pages. Uh, I'll point out things as I go along um, in things that may not be in the slides, I'll at least point them out in the book so that we can kind of either follow along or uh, jot some things down and uh, we'll cover them in class. If you have any questions, uh, we'll go over those in class and we'll try to make things a little more clear. Um, but I think for the most part, this is pretty straightforward. So here we go. So for chapter 19, assessing health and physical examination. The learning outcomes. Um, I want you to be able to identify the purposes and components of a physical examination. I want you to be able to discuss the differences among a comprehensive, focused, and ongoing physical examination. Be able to describe how to prepare for a physical examination and demonstrate the skills used in a physical examination. Explain adaptations that may be required when you examine clients of various ages and identify the components of a general survey. You'll be able to conduct a full physical examination of a patient and discuss the expected findings of a physical ex examination. You should be able to document the findings of a physical examination and perform a brief bedside physical examination. So there's a lot to learn and we'll be covering about 95 slides, so bear with me. All right, so uh, performing the physical examination. So the nursing physical examination, it's uh, part of a general health assessment. Um, it's used to gather data about the patient and focus on functional abilities and responses to his illnesses and stressors. The purpose of an assessment um, is to establish a baseline. Um, you have to remember, you don't know anything about your patient. Um, they may be, have been admitted in the middle of the night and you're getting there in, um, first thing in the morning, or the patient may have gotten there the day before, and again, you still haven't taken care of this patient before. So you don't know what the baseline is and you have to kind of determine that. So the assessment itself is really to help uh, determine what they can, can't do, um, what problems they may have, um, illnesses in the past or uh, things we need to fix for the future. The assessment also identifies nurses, nursing diagnosis. Um, so if a patient comes in with pain, um, the nursing diagnosis will be pain and you have to figure out what to do to control it and to um, do interventions in order to fix that problem. Um, you also monitor the status of identified problems. So a patient comes in with chest pain, um, you're going to identify um, the uh, things that may have caused it, and then you have to obviously find interventions to correct it. And you also screen for health problems. Your patient may have come in for chest pain, but they may have a slew of other problems in the past that they may have never had checked out or um, need to be fixed while they're there. So types of a physical examination. Um, the first one is comprehensive. Uh, this is an interview plus the complete head to toe assessment. So if you get an admission during the day, um, you'll sit down with a patient and you ask them a series of questions, uh, whether it be past medical history, medications that they take daily, um, problems um, that they've had that may have contributed to their um, admission to the hospital, and you'll also do a head-toe assessment. Uh, for a focused assessment, um, it's on just the presenting problem. So if you have a patient that comes in with pneumonia, yes, you'll do a head-to-toe assessment, but you're going to focus more on the lungs and be more very uh, more uh, specific about what you're assessing for the lungs. The ongoing um, assessment is performed as needed to assess the status of something. So if your patient comes in with pneumonia, yes, you'll do a, um, a full head to toe assessment, but you're going to focus on the lungs. But throughout the day, you're going to continue assessing the lungs to make sure that what you're doing throughout the day, whether it be breathing treatments or medications, um, are working and, and making the, sort of that status uh, gets better. And then you're going to evaluate the, the client's outcome or the patient's outcome to the, uh, the medication and your interventions that you're performing. All right, so organizing the examination. Um, your head-to-toe assessment will start at the head and you'll progress down to the toes. Um, the way I assess my patients is just that. I start with their head. Um, 
then I'll do their heart, their lungs, uh, their ab, you know, abdomen, listening to the bowel sounds. I'll check their legs. I'll check for pulses, uh, pushes, pulls, and grips. Um, those are things we'll go throughout this PowerPoint. Um, and like I said, it's a, system, a systematic um, way of, of assessing your patient. And let's see here. So body systems, uh, you're going to gather system related data all at once. Uh, there's no point in going into a room and checking their lungs and then leaving and coming back and checking their heart. I mean, that's going to take you all day. So you want to uh, give yourself enough time to be able to go in the room, um, assess them head to toe um, and do it all at once and, and do it correctly because if not, you have to come back and that, that wastes time. So. Um, maybe done in a predetermined order, then maybe it's the other two. So neurological, cardiovascular, respiratory, uh, gastrointestinal. So again, you're working from the head down to the toes. So you want to prepare yourself. Um, the first one is going to be theoretical theoretical knowledge. Um, obviously, your anatomy and physiology, you've, you've all had that. You've learned where things are and how they work. Um, and now it's really a matter of teaching you how to uh, assess those things. Um, Self-knowledge skill and comfort level. Um, you're just starting out, so we're not expecting you to know everything, but we've got to start somewhere. And that's what this chapter is all about, is kind of showing you um, a little bit at a time for each system. And willingness to seek help. Um, I do still work bedside at Scottsdale Healthcare, and um, I am always asking my colleagues or my coworkers, uh, what would they do? Or, or this is what I found, this is kind of normal, what do you think? Um, you know, look to each other and, um, and the nurses you'll be working with for, for help because they're a great tool. Um, knowledge about the client and the situation. Again, you're not going to know anything about them, and, and this is your way of being able to figure out what's going on and, and what led up to this. Um, this knowledge um, is going to find, you know, be able to give you the purpose of the exam and, um, and do the client diagnosis. Um, again, it's going to be a nursing diagnosis. So your, pain's already, your patient has already been admitted for a specific diagnosis. It's now trying to determine what your nursing diagnosis is and what you can do uh, to make them better. So you're going to prepare the environment. Um, privacy is the key. Um, at Scottsdale, we have some private rooms. So we have two patients uh, per room, or we may have private rooms. So you have to kind of uh, go in the room and figure out um, what you could do to kind of make things a little more private. You know, we're used to just pulling back covers and looking at people's bodies and, and not blinking twice. Um, but your patient may have never been through this before. So, you know, modesty is the key, um, you know, using curtains and draping them and kind of making them feel a little more comfortable and, and, and the fact that you don't know them and they don't know you and, and um, that's kind of, you know, disturbing for some people. So, like I said, privacy is the key. Um, noise control. Um, turn off the TV and the radio. Um, your patients all have a TV and they usually are watching because there's nothing else to do. Um, when you go and do your assessment, turn those things off. It's it's okay. You have to be able to um, focus on them and they have to focus on you. So, you know, you're asking them questions and you're trying to determine what's going on. Um, you don't need the distractions. Um, and as far as enabling visualization, um, you also need adequate light. Um, I usually go in the room and I at least open up the blinds and, and you know, give myself a little more lighting. If you need more than that, you can turn on the lights. But again, you know, tell your patient what you're doing. You know, close your eyes. I'm turning on the lights and um, I'm going to open up the blinds so I can see a little bit better. And, and it's all about communication and making them feel comfortable and, and still you being able to do your job. Uh, preparing the client, you're going to promote client comfort, um, developing a rapport. Again, go in the room, be yourself, um, be um, personable. Um, I think that when we go in the room and, and just kind of strike up conversations and talk to them and be normal people, it kind of makes them a little more relaxed. And it, uh, being professional is is definitely a, uh, a necessity in nursing, but um, sometimes you get a little too professional and, they, and you kind of lose your patient a little bit um so like i said being yourself and being um you know available to talk and and struggle with the conversations and stuff it kind of makes them feel more comfortable and you'll build that rapport and you'll get more information out of them um explain the procedures to them um you know i start ivs all the time and and i tell them step by step what i'm doing um so that way they're aware of of what's happening um if you don't explain things to them they they come the patients will come up with answers themselves that may or may not be correct. Um, be respectful of cultures and differences. Um, 
living in Arizona, we have a large population of Hispanics and Native Americans, Caucasians, African Americans, and stuff. So, as you go through your blocks in nursing school, you'll you'll learn that different cultures expect different things, or um, you know their perceptions, or their even um, their interactions with the nursing staff um, is a little different. So, you'll learn how to um, you know interact with these uh, ethnic backgrounds and stuff. So. And use proper positioning for your assessment. Um, you know, have them sit up, um, have them um, be comfortable, and and still be able to do your job a little bit. And we'll go over that as we go over these uh, powerpoints. All right. So there's four major skills uh, used in your physical exam. Uh, you're going to do inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. And we'll go over those. So for inspection, you're going to uh, use site to gather your data. So again, you're going to go in the room, you're going to assess your patient. Um, used, the, used throughout the physical examination, you may use an autoscope, uh, a pen light, um, or something else to kind of, you know, uh, check their eyes and stuff. Um, you're also going to, you know, examine their, their skin for color. Um, you're going to check whether or not they're able to walk based on their gait, uh, the general appearance of them overall, and, and also their behavior. So inspection is really just the, the, the assessment itself and gathering all the data. So for palpation, uh, it's the use of touch to gather your data. You're going to begin with light pressure uh, moving to deep palpation. Um, you're going to use your fingertips and, for the most part, um, the palms of your hands in order to uh, feel. Um, you're going to check for edema, moisture, um, anatomical landmarks and masses. So you're really just using your fingers to kind of lightly touch them and figure out if there's, you know, um, areas of their bodies that need uh, to be addressed or things that are kind of abnormal. So here are uh, two pictures of light palpation, uh, or one picture of light palpation, the other one's the deep palpation. Uh, again, you're looking for um, uh, masses and you're, you can check for organs and, and things that are abnormal. So for percussion, um, this is a tapping on the skin to elicit sound. Um, there's a direct and indirect. These are useful for, uh, useful for assessing ab um, abdomen, lungs, and underlying structures. Um, the example here is distended bladder. Um, by tapping, you can kind of either hear hollow sounds, or if um, it sounds a little bit different, you can hear that it's actually full. So for auscultation, uh, this is a use of hearing uh, to gather assessment data. The direct auscultation is listening without an instrument. So um, if you walk into the room and your patient has pneumonia and they have uh, really loud wheezing, um, you can hear that at the doorway. Um, for indirect auscultation, this is the use of your stethoscope. So you're using that to actually listen to the heart and the lungs and the uh, bowel sounds um, for your assessment. So for age modifications um, in the physical examination, um, I work bedside and I do adults. Um, Scottsdale uh, Healthcare Osborne does not have a peds department, so um, that's not my expertise. So for this, um, I'm going to have you, I'm going to have you uh, look at uh, page 377, um, which is going to cover the infants, toddlers, preschoolers, and school-aged children and adolescents for their assessments. So for older adults, um, which is my expertise, uh, the modifications um, for an older adult may be uh, special positioning related to mobility, um, adapt examination to vision and hearing changes, um, assess for change in physical ability, and assess for ability to perform activities of daily uh, living and provide periods of rest. So again, you know, your patient who is elderly, um, you might have to make some provisions for your assessment to um, be able to get the, you know, to get gather the data from them, whether it be asking them questions and then responding or physically um, assessing them to determine what they can and can't do. All right, so basic components of a comprehensive examination. Uh, begin at first contact. Um, it's your overall impression of the patient um, and the differences uh, will lead you to focus assessments. So uh, you're going to look for appearance and behavior. You're going to look for grooming and hygiene, body type and posture, their mental state, speech, vital signs, and height and weight. 
So we're going to start off with integumentary uh, skin characteristics. You're going to look for color, temperature, moisture, texture, turgor, and edema. Uh, you'll also look for lesions. You'll assess their hair and their nails. Um, overall, you're, you're looking to find out um, from head to toe on their skin if there's something deviating from the norm. All right, so here's a picture of uh, the grading of edema. You can also find this on page 242 of your volume two book. Uh, with no edema, um, which is normal, um, you also have uh, trace or minimal depression uh, with pressure edema. You've got plus one, which is two millimeters in depression, um, and it usually rapidly returns to normal. Uh, with plus two, it's four millimeters uh, in depth, uh, but it returns in 10 to 15 seconds. Plus three is six millimeters in depth, but it returns um, uh, back to normal within one to two. And then with plus four, it's eight millimeters, and then it uh, takes about two to three minutes to get back to um, normal. And with your plus four, I mean, you definitely can tell, and, and your fingers sink pretty deep into their skin. Um, and again, edema is an abnormal finding. And here's your uh, secondary skin lesions. Um, for the most part, I think that what I've actually seen in my career is uh, the atrophy. Um, I've seen the scales. I've seen some crust, um, ulcers. Um, you've got the scarring, and then you got the keloid, and then the excoriation. Excoriation is probably the bigger one in your um, elderly adult population with uh, skin breakdown and not being turned, or their skin being constantly moist. Um, I mean, those are the ones that are usually in the continent and um, just need to be, like I said, changed and, and, and um, repositioned. All right, next you're going to assess the hair. You're going to assess the uh, scalp and their body hair. You're going to inspect for hair, the hair uh, for color, quantity, distribution, uh, the condition of their scalp, whether or not they've got dandruff, whether or not it's too oily. You're also going to palpate the texture of the hair. You're going to palpate the scalp for mobility and uh, tenderness. All right, this slide's going to be on the assessment of the nail. You can pay, find this on page 249. Uh, let's see here, the healthy nail beds are level and firm and similar to the color of the skin. This shape is convex with a nail plate angle of 160 degrees. For older adults, the nail grows more slowly and becomes thicker and will tend to split. Abnormal findings will be uh, yellow, blue or black discoloration. White spots may indicate zinc deficiency. Spoon-shaped or concave nails are associated with iron deficiency. And, and if you turn to page 250, which is the next page, they have a picture of um, how to assess uh, capri fill. Um, this is going to assess for circulatory problems. If you uh, briefly press on the tip of the nail um, with steady pressure and release, you'll actually see the uh, skin or the nail change from white to red. This is you squeezing the blood out of the fingertip and then it refilling. Normal, normal, normal capillary refill is uh, less than two to three seconds. For older adults, the cap refill um, may, time may be slower. Um, for males, it tends to be a little bit faster. And um, in people who have circulatory problems, it, it does take a little bit longer to, uh, uh, to come back. All right, so for clicker check, it would be most important for the nurse to include the fingernails in a basic assessment for the client with a neurological condition, a musculoskeletal condition, an integumentary condition, or a respiratory condition. And the answer will be C. Changes in the color of the nail bed as well as the shape and texture of the nail can indicate underlying tissue issues with oxygenation. All right, so now we're going to move on to the head, eyes, neck, ears, nose, and mouth. So for the head, you're going to um, inspect or assess the skull and the face. Uh, you're going to assess for size, shape, and facial features. For the eyes, you're going to assess for ex the external eye, the sclera, the pupils. Uh, you'll assess for visual acuity. Vision um, examinations um, for acuity, distance, near, uh, whether or not they're colorblind and visual fields and internal structures. And here's a picture of uh, assessing the extraocular movements. All right, so for the neck, ears, nose, and mouth, uh, for the neck, you're going to uh, assess for musculature, trachea, thyroid gland, and the cervical lymph nodes. For the ears and hearing, you're going to assess the external ear, the inner ear, you're going to assess uh, their hearing uh, with the Weber's test and the Rhine's test, and then you'll assess their balance with the Romberg's test.
for the nose, you're going to assess for patency and whether or not they can smell. And you're going to assess the mouth, which will assess the lips, buccal mucosa, teeth, and heart and soft palates. So for the basic assessment of the lungs, you're going to assess the uh, uh, chest and the lungs and describe the size and shape of the chest. You also uh, assess for related findings to landmarks. And you also assess for breath sounds. You'll assess for bronchial, bronchovesicular, vesicular, adventitious, diminished or misplaced or abnormal vocal sounds. So for assessing lung sounds, um, you can find this picture in your volume one book on page 393. Uh, this gentleman is uh, showing you where the bronchial, bronchial and vesicular and vesicular um, lung sounds are. With the bronchial, um, usually it's found over the trachea. With the bronchial vesicular, it's usually found on either side of the sternum, and the vesicular is usually the outlying areas um, ranging across the chest and just below the nipple line. If you look at um, section or um, picture number D, it uh, shows you the posterior um, portion of the gentleman um, and showing the bronchial, bronchial vesicular, and vesicular areas too. This picture actually shows how to assess the lung sounds, um, and I do the same thing. I usually will start off with number one, which is at the right uh, clavicle, and move myself across to the left, and then down and, and over to number two. So it's more of a zigzag pattern um, going from number one down to number five, and number five usually is uh, below the nipple line, and that's roughly where the base of the lungs are. And this is the posterior um, uh, portion of the gentleman and you're doing the exact same thing you're starting off with um, his uh, you know clavicle and moving across and then like I said doing the zigzag line until you get to number um, eight and nine which is the um, uh, vesicular portion of his uh, chest <clears throat> So as far as uh, what you'll be hearing over these areas, um, for the bronchial, it's a loud, high-pitched with hollow quality. Um, it's heard best over the trachea. And for bronchial vesicular, it's a blowing sound of medium pitch and intensity. And it's best heard over uh, the branching of the bronchi, which again is on, on either side of the sternum. And for vesicular, it's a soft, breezy, low-pitched sound heard best over the bronchioles or lungs in the periphery. So again, it's the uh, the rest of the chest and, and just below the nipple line. In this slide, it actually shows you the abnormal lung sounds. Um, I found these on your volume two book on page 281. Um, for the first one is crackles, uh, which is a bubbling, crackling, popping, uh, soft, high-pitched, and very brief sound usually heard during inspiration. Um, for these patients, usually they have pneumonia, congestive heart failure, um, bronchitis, or emphysema. With uh, wheezing, um, usually it's a high-pitched musical or squeaking sound heard during inspiration or expiration. And these are also for patients who have um, acute asthma or emphysema. I have heard um, more commonly with wheezing um, patients who have pneumonia, uh, congestive heart failure, or um, bronchitis or emphysema. Um, usually it's the fluid is you know, filling up their lungs and they, they really need to cough and they cough it and it kind of starts to rattle a little bit. And uh, the more you can thin it out and the more they can cough it up, the better it usually gets. With the uh, ronchi, um, this one is going to be the coarse snoring and continuous low pitch sounds uh, heard during inspiration and expiration and made clear with coughing. This is usually found with patients with bronchitis, emphysema, um, narrow airway or airways or fibrotic um, lungs. So with Strider, um, this is a high-pitched continuous honking sound heard throughout the respiratory cycle, um, but most uh, prominent in, on inspiration. It's usually with patients with acute respiratory distress, foreign body in the airway, or epiglottis. Um, my experience has been with the foreign body in the airway. It's uh, for patients who are elderly who uh, can't swallow real well, or they don't have the muscle strength to swallow, uh, and they tend to aspirate on their uh, food. And that will tend to collect in their lungs, and they start getting aspiration pneumonia. And again, what you do is antibiotics and breathing treatments, and this will kind of help clear things up a little bit. All right, so here's uh, fine crackles and rails. And I'm now finding that if you actually hover over listen, it will actually take you to a website that uh, will allow you to actually hear them. And here's, of course, crackles. 
uh, wheezing, strider, and then diminished basses. But diminished basses is usually, um, it's, you can hear some movement, but it's so um, um, light and, um, and silent that you really can't hear a whole lot. All right, so common errors to avoid uh, when listening to the lung sounds. Um, you're going to uh, listen to the breath sounds, or you're not going to listen to the breath sounds uh, through a patient's gown or clothes. Um, they tend to rub up against your stethoscope, and, and it kind of muffles the sounding a little bit. Um, don't allow tubing uh, to rub against the bed rails or the patient's clothes, because again, that will actually um, kind of you know change the way you can hear their breathing. Um, don't interpret chest hairs um, to sound as ventitious sounds. So again, gentlemen who are, tend to be hairier, um, that will kind of um, change the way the breath sounds sound. And then uh, don't just oscillate the convenience sites. Um, you'll have patients who are elderly that won't be able to sit up or roll very well. Um, and nurses will tend to just listen to the interior lungs. Um, you really do need to kind of roll them and sit them up and, and try to do what you can to listen to the posterior lungs too. So for inspection, um, you're going to uh, check for respiratory rate, rhythm, pattern, and depth. The uh, normal rate for uh, someone to breathe is 10 to 20 breaths per minute. You're going to count for 30 seconds or for a full minute. Um, this gives you a really good idea of how well they breathe. If you do 15 seconds or, or 20 seconds or, or less than the 30 seconds, you don't really get a good idea of, of what they're truly capable of. Um, you're also going to assess for normal um, breathing, whether or not it's re relaxed, regular, on, um, automatic, or silent. And then you're going to check, uh, chart those normal breathing patterns. So for inspection, um, you're going to check whether or not they have normal or labor breathing. You'll also check to see if they have to use their accessory muscles in order to breathe. Uh, for this gentleman in this picture, um, he's so thin and um, he's looks like he's had respiratory issues for a very long time. Um, the normal accessory muscles tend to wear out and get tired, so you have to start using other uh, muscles. So for uh, use of muscles other than the diaphragm and intercostal muscles um, are seen in labor breathing. Uh, the sternocleidomastoid, um, the spinal and the neck muscles tend to have to take over to help this gentleman breathe. You're also going to assess for pursed lip breathing. This is a partially closing of the lips to allow air to be expired slowly. Um, this is usually with patients who have COPD and uh, pul pulmonary diseases. Um, they're able to take the deep breaths, but they kind of tend to hold it and, um, and breathe slower so that they can kind of be able to use all the oxygen that they've consumed. Um, and also, again, their, their lungs are very, or their muscles are very tired. So for them to be able to take the deep breath, it's, it's hard for their muscles to be able to extract that air. So you're going to inspect the anterior and posterior thorax. Um, the picture on the left is for a normal adult, um, which is probably you and I. Um, this is uh, more of a um, an oblong, you know, chair chest area. With the picture on the right, it's the barrel chest. Um, this is usually for patients who have COPD or other uh, pulmonary issues because their their muscles have to really be used in order to. Uh, um, inhale and exhale properly. So respiratory patterns, uh, the first one is normal. You can see where it goes up and down, so you have a equal amount of inspiration and expiration. And normal, um, which is the um, second picture, is the, you have the equal amounts of inhale and exhale, but a sigh is that longer um, inspiration. So for tachypnea, uh, this is a rapid, shallow breathing. Um, this is you breathing in and out very quickly. And with bradypnea, this is actually the same thing, but it's also the opposite. So it's uh, you're just taking slower breaths um, at a regular rate. Hyperventilation is inhaling and exhaling um, deeper but faster. And hypoventilation is not taking deep breaths or um, exhaling deep enough and, um, and also being very slow. So it's an irregular and shallow. Chain Stokes is uh, periods of apnea followed by a gradually increasing depth of frequency. Um, this for me is probably relates more to people who have sleep apnea. They'll breathe 
um, somewhat normally, and then they tend to not breathe for a couple seconds, and then they their body has to kick in and, and instinctively take bigger, deep breaths in order to compensate for what they've lost. For Kusmols, uh, which is very deep gasping respiration associated with severe diabetic acidosis and coma, uh, you also find that this is uh, more for patients who are passing away. Um, the the breaths are, like I said, are, are deep, but they're more gasping. They just can't, they can take the deep breath, but it's not moving anywhere. All right, so now we're going on to the cardiovascular uh, system. So for your assessment, you're going to assess for the heart. You're going to inspect the uh, the PMI, um, the heaves and lifts. You'll palpate the thrill. You'll listen for heart sounds, the location, which would be the aortic, pulmonic, tricuspid, and mitral valves. And the components of those valves are the S1, S2, S3, and S4. And you possibly may also hear murmurs. All right, so for basic assessment, you're going to assess the heart and the vessels. So for cardiovascular vessels, you'll assess for the carotid arteries. You'll palpate and, um, and check for pulsation. And uh, you'll also oscillate for a brewery. For You'll do the same thing for jugular veins. And for peripheral vessels, which is the arms and the legs, you'll uh, check for blood pressure, peripheral pulses, signs of inadequate oxygenation, which is the uh, cap refill, and also check for ver uh, varicocies. So this picture, uh, which is also found in your volume one book on page 394, I think this is a really good picture of being able to uh, determine where the aortic, pulmonic, um, and the tricuspid and mitral valves are found, and also the apex. Um, at some point, you'll learn how to actually do an apical pulse, uh, which is the um, the last, you know, dot on the picture. Um, and this is where you're able to hear the, uh, the S1, S2, S3, and S4. So oscillation goals. Um, you'll review the uh, anatomic relationship of the heart to the chest wall. Again, this picture does a very good uh, uh, job as far as pointing out where those are. You'll locate uh, and listen to the areas, uh, which is the aortic, pulmonic, tricuspid, and mitral valves. And uh, again, here's another picture of it. Uh, when I was in nursing school, we did uh, ape to man. So that way we were able to determine where the aortic, pulmonic, tricuspid, and mitral valves are. The uh, aortic and pulmonic are usually um, on either side of the sternum. And then the um, uh, herbs point is below that. Then you've got the tricuspid and mitral valves kind of following down more on the left-hand side. Um, again, here's another picture, uh, the aortic valve, uh, which is the second intercostal space, uh, right sternal border. Uh, S2 is actually heard here. S2 is the dub of the lub dub. So if you're actually listening to the heart and you hear lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, S2 is that dub, um, which is the aortic valve. Pulmonic is actually the second intercostal space, and that's where you also hear S2, uh, which is that dub. Tricuspid valve uh, is fourth intercostal space, and this is S1, so this is your lub of the lub dub. And the uh, mitral valves are also the same thing. Fifth, fifth intercostal space, and this is where you also hear S1, which is the lub. So you've got lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. You're actually hearing S1, S2, S1, S2, S1, S2. And let's see here, apical pulse. Uh, it's the point of maximal impulse. Uh, it's the fifth intercostal space. It's just below the nipple line on the left-hand side. And um, it's medial to the left mid-clavicular line. So I basically take the, uh, the left cl uh, clavicle and just follow it down right below the nipple, and there it is. Heart sounds, again, we have the S1, S2. We've got the lub dub. Um, the lub is the mitral tricuspid valves, and the S2, which is the dub, is the aortic or pulmonic valves. S1, um, the onset of systole is systole. It's a period of ventricular contraction. It's heard best at the apex, also known as the, um, the mitral valve and the fifth intercostal space. The S2 is the onset of dist uh, diastole. Uh, it's a period of ventricular relaxation, and it's heard best at the uh, aortic area, which is the second intercostal space. The normal heart sounds is S3, which is Kentucky, and S4, which is Tennessee. Um, these two, I think I've actually heard maybe once in my career, but it's not very common, uh, but they're nice to know.
and normal heart sounds or murmurs. These I've actually heard before. Um, working at Scottsdale Healthcare, I work as a float nurse. So I go to work and they tell me where to go. I tend to do uh, cardiology or tele and um, the ortho floor a lot. And um, here I've actually heard the murmurs and those are more of a whooshing sound. So when you're hearing the lub dub, you can hear it, but you also hear that whoosh, 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 and, and it's pretty distinctive. All right, so for this section, we're going to listen or actually uh, assess for breast and the axillary. Um, we'll quickly go over it, but not too much detail because you'll get this more in your um, OB rotation um, and your other blocks. So for assessing the breast, um, you'll actually have your patient sit up, you'll have them lean over a little bit, and you're actually assessing the size and shape, uh, check for nipple characteristics, uh, tissue, and you're also going to include the axillary, which is the armpit area normal findings on the physical examination. You Again, you'll look for the upper uh, quadrant, the upper inner quadrant, and the lower quadrant, um, and then the lower uh, inner quadrant of the, uh, the breast. And here's a great picture of being able to uh, assess for the, the breast itself. All right, so for the abdomen, um, this is um, the, the area where you kind of change things up a little bit <clears throat> and you're going to um, assess the uh, abdomen in a different order. So you're going to inspect, then you'll oscillate, then you'll percuss, and then you'll palpate. Um, the reason why you do this is because if you inspect what you're looking at the skin, and then you oscillate by actually listening to the bowel sounds, you will then percuss and palpate um, as far as the organs and, and, and checking for different you know uh, sounds and stuff. And the reason why you do this is because if you percuss and palpate first, by pushing, you tend to move things around, um, especially air, and uh, you may actually, um, can, you know, kind of start a peristalsis a little bit. Um, so those kind of uh, throw off the sound. So you always want to listen and, and check first, and then start to uh, percuss and palpate. Um, this actual picture shows the uh, four quadrants. Um, there you have a right upper, left upper, right lower, left lower quadrant. Um, the way I kind of do it is I check with the belly button first. Um, a horizontal line from there uh, will separate the right or the upper and the lower uh, quadrants. And then I use the, uh, the same belly button and straight up, which will actually give me the, uh, the right and the left quadrants. So same concept, but like I said, I use the belly button as the... Uh, um, as a point to be able to um, cross-sect the area. All right, so for this area, it's the musculoskeletal. Um, so you're going to assess for body shape and symmetry. You're going to check for posture and gait and spinal curvature. You also um, use the Romberg's test for balance. Um, you also check for coordination, which will use the finger to thumb opposition. You'll check for movement. You also check for joint mobility. Uh, you'll check for color change, deformity, and crevitus. And for muscle strength, you'll change. You'll assess for range of motion and resistance. All right. So your assessment uh, begins with a meet and greet. So you watch them uh, rise from the chair or the bed, or they get up and go. Uh, for this, you again, you're assessing the patient for the first time. You don't know how they move, or can they move, or what assisted devices they actually need to move. So you're going to start with the conversation and ask them. You know, so you know, how do you get up? Can you get up? Um, do you need for me to help you go to the bathroom um, um, and, and be able to get around the room? You're also going to assess for uh, them climbing in and out of bed um, or using uh, the bedside table. You're going to watch for coordination and you're going to note their speed. Um, patients tend to, um, you know, well, elderly patients tend to move a little bit slower and you're going to kind of assess for that. Again, you ask for any assisted devising, devices, whether or not that you need to use a cane, a walker, um, or a wheelchair. And then you ask them whether or not they're able to use their ADLs, which is their active uh, daily um activities of daily living and find out whether they could either can do it or do they need assess, you know, assistance to actually do that. So activities of daily living um, are bathing, ambulating, transferring, toileting, eating, and dressing. 
So again, you're going to assess whether or not they can actually do these things by themselves. Um, I typically ask my patient for the first time in meeting them whether or not they're able to, um, you know, do these things. And I usually ask them, you know, do you live at home or do you live in a home? Um, being at home, they may or may not be able to do all these things. And if they're living in a home, they may have some assistance uh, to help them out. So this helps you determine what you have to do for the day. All right, so this slide actually uh, will uh, show you the different movements of the skeletal muscles. Um, and I believe the next slide also um, will give you some pointers as far as assessing your patient. Um, so if the first picture is flex flexion and extension, um, you've got abduction and adduction, uh, pronation and supination, uh, circulation, You've got the rotation of the head. You've got the elevation and depression of the shoulders. You've got the protraction and retraction of the neck. And then you've got the inversion and eversion of the... Uh... All right, so you've got range of motion. Um, in your book on page uh, 398, you've got uh, the range of motion, which is to um, for the patient to be able to move their entire... Uh, leg or arm or their joint um, in a full range of motion. You've got the passive range of motion, which is the uh, patient's able, unable to exercise each, jo each joint independently. Um, this is really to assess their muscle strength. So you've got the flexion, extension, you've got hyper extension, um, abduction, adduction, the rotations. Um, you got the moving past the extension, uh, moving away from the midline, toward the midline. So you're really just kind of checking all the, uh, the extremities and the different uh, joints of the body and find out what they can and can't do. So you're also going to check for their strength and their grips. Uh, the nurse or you will generally assess whether or not they actually can grip your hands. So you ask the patient to uh, make a fist and squeeze their hand around your two fingers. Um, you do two fingers because uh, if by them squeezing your two fingers, it's less likely to hurt if they do have full strength. Um, if the grip is normal, then you'll be able to, um, you won't be able to pull your fingers out of their, their grasp. Um, but you'll test each hand separately because it will determine whether or not if one side is weaker than the other. The same thing with pushes. Uh, you ask the uh, the patient to actually, um, you know, step on the gas with their feet, and you're at the same time pushing on their feet. And this is to determine the resistance um, against your hand. Again, you will uh, test each foot separately to determine whether or not one is stronger than the other. So for assessing the neurological status of your patient, um, there's several things you'll do. For um, Checking their level of consciousness, um, the first thing you can do is actually arouse them. Usually this happens by walking in the room or calling their name or making your presence known. Uh, they tend to respond to um, you being there. Um, another thing you can do as far as assessing your patient and their neurological status is to um, find out whether or not they understand or know what the time is, the, the place, or who they are. Um, you can ask them, you know, where are you, and do you know where you know where you are, or what the time is, and, and what the date is, and um, and again, you know, a lot of times you'll you know ask them their name and stuff, and they respond to that. I find that if you actually walk in the room and strike up a conversation and just talk to them about current events or how things are at home or what they've done in the past or or why they're there, a lot of times you can determine um, their their orientation just based on that conversation. And they may start off um, orientated, but then you can kind of, um, like I said, the more you talk to them, the more you find out that maybe they're just not quite orientated as much as you thought they were. Uh, a lot of times if the TV's on, I'll use that as a uh, talking point, you know, talk about current events, ask them what, you know, they're watching, um, you know, and just like I said, just general conversation tends to kind of determine their orientation. You also assess their behavior, their appearance, uh, their response to stimuli, uh, their speech, memory, communication, judgment. I mean, these are things, like I said, if you strike up a conversation and really just talk to them and, um, and get a feel for what, you know, is going on and, and what their mentation is, a lot of times you can find this out based on just talking to them. And then you can actually do a cranial nerve assessment. So you can actually check their reflexes. Uh, you'll uh, check their automatic responses. You'll check their responses um, and then grade them on a zero is no response or four is being clonus. Um, you'll also assess their motor and cerebral function. You'll check for movement, coordination, tone, posture, equilibrium, and um, proprioception. So with uh, proprioception, 
Um, this is actually the um, ability to position their own body. Um, you'll find that patients who have had either some sort of stroke um, or cerebral accident, that they tend to lean to one side. Um, you can prop them back up and, and align them with the bed, but then they tend to kind of lean. So that's, that's what that means. And uh, let's see here. So for the neurological, you also assess for sensory function. You'll determine whether or not they can feel light touch, light pain, um, whether or not they can determine temperature, vibration, position, and sense. Um, if you actually go to your hard book or volume one, um, on page 400 is the cranial nerves and, and what they do. Uh, and then further on, you'll, you'll find out how to actually assess um, for the cranial nerves and whether or not they're uh, deficient in certain areas. All right, so for this section, it's the Glasgow Coma Scale. You could find this in your uh, volume two books, page 314. You're going to uh, use the Glasgow Coma Scale to assess uh, their eye response, motor response, and verbal response. And um, it's to, to assess their consciousness um, and monitor uh, whether or not they're alert and oriented and, and how mentality is, is going. Again, you're actually checking for eye verbal motor response. The score as a maximum is 15, the minimum is 3. Um, a score of less than 8 is considered to um, indicate unconsciousness. Um, even if you're dead, you get a minimum of 3, um, just because your <laughs> no response is a 1. Um, and th that's throughout the, the three different scales. So you'll use this to actually assess um, you know, the, the consciousness of your actual patient. Again, here's the, the scale itself. You've got eye opening uh, spontaneously is basically calling their name or asking them to open their eyes. Um, they, if they don't do it based on um, just you walk in the room, um, then if they respond to you based on you talking to them, you give them a three. If they respond to just pain, you give them a two. And if they don't respond at all, then you give them a one. So and the same thing with uh, verbal response. You know, you find out whether or not they're orientated, whether or not they're confused, um, inappropriate. Um, inappropriate is more of you talking to them and then not being able to train, you know, follow a train of thought um, or incomprehensible. Motor response is whether or not you can actually ask them to move their arms, and they do, um, or if you actually have to literally give them um, some slight pain in order to them to respond and be able to follow your commands. Um, again, your maximum score is a 15, and your minimum is at least a 3. So this section is the uh, genital urinary assessment. For a male, this includes the reproductive um, system and uh, gathering the information. You're going to look at the external genitalia. You'll look at their penis, their urethra, um, the opening. Uh, you'll check for the scrotum, lymph nodes, and pubic hair. You'll examine for the presence of a hernia. And for females, you'll actually um, assess their external genitalia, which is the labia, the clitoris, the urethral opening, uh, vaginal orifice, pubic hair, and lymph nodes. Um, other th um, things that are within this system is the kidneys, the bladder. Um, only a nurse practitioner or a doctor can actually um, assess the anus and the rectum and the prostate. Um, and they're also responsible for a pelvic examination. The reason why this is important is that uh, nurses at the bedside used to be able to assess these things. But uh, throughout the years, I think that either the assessment wasn't done very well or things you know, bad things happen and it just turns into um, just be more of a specialty as far as being able to assess those things. All right, so how do they go to the bathroom? So again, when you do your assessment, you're going to walk in the room and you're going to assess different areas and, and finding out, you know, whether or not they can walk, um, whether or not they have a bedside commode at the bedside or urinal. Um, you got to determine how they can actually uh, urinate or have bowel movement. So for here, you're going to uh, determine whether or not they have a Foley catheter, um, and you'll um, assess this from the, um, you know, from the bag all the way up to the actual body, and uh, you'll describe, especially for the urine, uh, you know, color and whether or not it's got sediment. If it's cloudy, it's clear, um, and then you know, like I said again, you're going to determine if they can actually uh, void on their own, or do they actually need help, um, or do they, are they just incontinent? Again, for urine, it's color, the amount, odor, clarity. And for pattern, um, again, you're going to find out whether or not they actually can get up, 
they could do it themselves or if they're just incontinent. And then uh, see here, genitalia with advanced, uh, just look to see if it's normal and clean. So again, as part of your assessment is to determine whether or not they've got um, either some sort of drainage or um, an odor or something around their genitalia um, to, that needs to be addressed. As far as bowel movements, um, I do this on a daily basis. I assess my patient, and one of the things I ask them is, when's the last time you went to the bathroom? Um, you'll be surprised on how many patients who in the hospital have not had a bowel movements in days. And a lot of this is from them laying in bed and not uh, moving real well and, um, and, and, you know, I mean, pain medication slows everything down. So and it tends to constipate people. So if you don't ask, they don't tell you. So uh, as far as the rectum and anus, uh, you'll wear gloves, um, you'll inspect for rashes, scars, and hemorrhoids, and you'll palpate any lumps or unusual areas. So variations in examinations. Uh, so be aware of normal physiological changes. So, you know, look at yourself. You know, you kind of know what's normal, what's abnormal. And when you assess your patients, they're kind of looking for the same thing. Uh, be aware of stiffness of muscles and joints from aging. Um, you'll expose only areas that need to be examined. Um, so use your drapes and use your, um, you know, close the door and use the blankets to kind of cover things up. Um, Answer any questions um, that your patients may have. Don't just assume that they know what you're doing. Explain things to them as you go. Uh, be aware of the cultural differences. You know, I'm being a male nurse. Uh, I've had patients that are older and female or of different ethnic backgrounds and cultures that just don't want a male nurse. So, you know, kind of just be conscious of that. Um, in range for an interpreter if you need it. If we have Spanish-speaking interpreters um, on site and you call them up and they come and they actually will help, um, you know, translate for you. Uh, ask your patients how they wish to be addressed. Um, I, I think in your generation or even my generation, we tend to address our patients by their first name, but you know, ask them. Um, I think past generations tend to um, you know, address them by their last name. And then uh, adapt techniques to um, you know, fit your patients. If they can't hear, if they can't see, um, if they're too tired. I mean, if they can't really follow what you're, you're asking them to do, then there's no point of actually pushing it. I mean, you still have to assess them, but you could always wait until there's an you know, adequate time or at the right time. So for the elderly, uh, plan several assessment times in order to not overtire them. Uh, with children, you're going to uh, proceed from the least invasive or most uh, comfortable and uh, go from there. Examine of the head, neck, heart, lungs, and range of motion can be done early. Uh, ears, mouth, abdomen, genitals should be left to the end. Um, again, you want to make them as comfortable as possible until you finally get to the uncomfortable parts. All right, so delegation of health assessment. Uh, due to the substantial knowledge and skill required, assessments are not to be delegated to nursing assistants. Um, the RN is the primary and the LPN is the secondary for assessing your patients. So it's really the job um, and the duty of the RN to do every initial assessment and, uh, and do the correct um, charting. Um, many aspects of, of nursing care um, are done by the RN and it's our responsibility. All right, so that's the end of the uh, PowerPoint. I uh, again, this is my first time doing it, and I hope to do them as I do them and get used to the screencast matic that this gets a little less boring and mundane and monotonous. And hopefully, I don't say um and like too many times. Again, if you have any questions, bring them to class, and we'll go over them, and uh, we'll make this uh, much clearer and uh, and more specific. So, thank you very much, and I will see you in a little while.